March 4, 1945. RAF Manston, Kent, England. 7.23 a.m. The morning fog hadn't yet burned off the runway when Lieutenant Colonel William Council pushed the throttle forward on a machine that looked like it had fallen from another century. The aircraft had no propeller, no spinning blades catching the cold English air, just a low, rising howl that turned into a banshee scream as the Lockheed P-80 shooting star accelerated down the tarmac at a speed that made the ground crew step back instinctively. Within seconds, Council was airborne. Within minutes, he was doing something no American pilot had ever done in combat theater, flying at 558 miles per hour in level flight. Across the channel, German radar operators watched the blip with confusion. It was moving too fast, faster than any Messerschmitt, faster than any Allied fighter they'd cataloged. One Luftwaffe intelligence officer would later write in his report, speed consistent with experimental rocket aircraft, origin unknown, threat assessment, extreme. But this wasn't a rocket. It was a jet engine wrapped in aluminum skin, designed in 143 days by a 33-year-old engineer named Clarence Kelly Johnson. And it represented a technological leap so profound that both sides of the war briefly wondered if the rules of aerial combat had just been rewritten overnight. The P-80 never fired a shot in anger during World War II but its mere presence in European skies sent a psychological shockwave through Axis intelligence that would outlast the war itself. This is the story of the jet that arrived too late to fight, but just in time to terrify. Before we continue deeper into this unbelievable story, take a second to like this video and subscribe for more untold war stories. By early 1945, the Luftwaffe had grown confident in one bitter truth. They still owned the speed advantage. The Messerschmitt ME-262 Schwalbe, the world's first operational jet fighter, had been terrorizing Allied bomber formations since July 1944. With a top speed of 540 miles per hour, it could outrun any piston engine fighter the Allies possessed. American P-51 Mustangs, British Spitfires, Soviet yaks, all of them were relics by comparison. German jet pilots didn't dogfight, they hunted. They'd appear out of nowhere, shred a B-17's wing with 30mm cannons, and vanish before the escorts could react. Oberlieutenant Franz Stiegler, a seasoned ME-262 pilot, later recalled, We felt untouchable. The Americans had numbers, yes, but we had evolution. We were flying in 1950, while they were still stuck in 1940. Then, in early March, something changed. A memo circulated through Luftwaffe High Command. British radar stations had logged an unidentified aircraft over the channel. Speed? Over 550 miles per hour. No propeller wash. No known silhouette. American markings. The message ended with a single line. Americaner haben Dusenjäger. The Americans have jets. And just like that, the Luftwaffe's smirk disappeared. The Lockheed P-80 shooting star wasn't just fast, it was reliably fast. And in 1945, that was the difference between a propaganda stunt and a war winner. While the ME-262 required obsessive maintenance, specialized fuel, and runways long enough to land a bomber, the P-80 was designed with one word tattooed into every blueprint. Simplicity. Kelly Johnson's team at Lockheed's Secret Skunk Works facility built the first prototype in just 143 days, using a British-designed Halford H-1 engine, later the American J-33. It could operate from standard airfields, it burned regular jet fuel, and it didn't explode on startup a problem that plagued early German jets. The philosophy was purely American. Make it work, make it reliable, make it everywhere.
Vignette 1, The Test Flight, Muroc Dry Lake, January 1944. Test pilot Milo Burcham pushed the XP-80 past 500 miles per hour on its fifth flight. The airframe didn't shudder. The engine didn't flame out. When he landed, he told the engineers, it flies like it's on rails. No torque, no propeller drag, just forward. Vignette 2, The Delivery, January 1945. Two P-80s were secretly shipped to Europe in crates labeled spare parts. When they were uncrated at Lucina Airfield in Italy, mechanics stood silent. One crew chief, Sergeant Vincent Daly, later said, I'd worked on P-38s, P-47s, everything. But this thing? It looked like someone stole it from 1960. Vignette 3, The Flyby, March 1945. A P-80 buzzed a formation of P-51 Mustangs over Belgium. The Mustang pilots, flying at full throttle, watched the jet scream past them like they were hovering. One pilot radioed, what the hell was that? Ground control responded, that's ours, and that's the future. The psychological effect wasn't just on the enemy, it was on everyone. Here's the cruel irony. The P-80 shooting star never fought in World War II. Not really, but the threat of it did. By April 1945, only four P-80s had reached Europe. None saw combat. The war in Europe ended on May 8, 1945, before they could be deployed operationally. But German intelligence didn't know that. Captured Luftwaffe documents reveal frantic speculation about American jet production. One German high command report estimated, incorrectly, that the U.S. had over 200 jet fighters in reserve, ready to flood European skies. They didn't, but the Germans believed they did. And that belief shifted strategic calculations in the war's final weeks. Meanwhile, across the Pacific, the P-80 was being prepared for the invasion of Japan. Production ramped up. Lockheed delivered 45 aircraft by war's end, with plans for 5,000 more. Training squadrons formed at bases in California and Nevada. Pilots who'd flown propeller planes their entire careers suddenly found themselves strapped into machines that redefined physics. One statistic haunted Axis planners. American factories could now produce a jet fighter in less time than it took Germany to repair one. A Japanese intelligence officer captured on Okinawa carried a drawing of the P-80 in his notebook. Beside it, he'd written in English, this changes everything. He was right. Even without firing a shot, the P-80 accomplished something no weapon in history had done. It made the enemy surrender to a possibility. German pilots who encountered the handful of P-80s in European skies described a profound disorientation. The jet didn't sound like a plane. It sounded like a continuous explosion. There were no propeller rhythms to track, no engine growl to anticipate. Just a rising, tearing roar that seemed to warp the air itself. Unteroffizier Klaus Hartmann, a ground controller stationed near Berlin, recorded this in his diary on April 12, 1945. We heard it before we saw it. A sound like tearing metal. Then it was overhead. Gone in seconds. Our flak didn't even train on it. We just watched. I think we all knew, in that moment, that we had lost more than the war. We had lost the future. For Japanese forces preparing for invasion, the psychological weight was even heavier. Kamikaze pilots were briefed that American jets could intercept them at speeds exceeding 500 miles per hour, faster than any dive they could attempt. Night bomber crews were told the P-80 would soon be equipped with radar. Coastal defense units received warnings that jet fighters could strafe beaches and disappear before anti-aircraft crews could react. None of this was true yet, but fear doesn't require proof. It requires plausibility. One captured Japanese naval officer, Lieutenant Hideaki Yamada, said in interrogation, We knew we could fight Mustangs. We knew we could fight Corsairs. But this? This was fighting tomorrow. And tomorrow always wins.
The P-80 wasn't born from genius alone. It was born from a system. Clarence Kelly Johnson didn't work in isolation. He worked inside a structure that could take an idea on Monday and have a prototype flying by Friday. The Skunk Works, Lockheed's advanced development division, operated on a principle that would define American aerospace for the next 50 years. Speed of iteration beats perfection of design. Johnson's team was small, 23 engineers and 30 machinists. They worked in a rented circus tent next to a plastics factory. The smell was unbearable. The hours were brutal. But in 143 days, they hand-built the XP-80 from scratch. Meanwhile, across America, the industrial engine roared. By 1945, Lockheed's Burbank plant could produce one P-80 every three days. General Electric's factories in Massachusetts were churning out J-33 jet engines at a rate Nazi Germany couldn't dream of matching. One riveter, Helen Kowalski, worked the P-80 line at Burbank. In a 1987 interview, she remembered, My son was flying P-47s in France. I'd build three jets in a week and think, maybe one of these will bring him home. It did. The war ended before he had to face another ME-262. This wasn't just a weapon. It was a promise. Forged in aluminum and turbine blades. We will build faster than you can destroy. In the end, the P-80 shooting star proved something more important than its speed. It proved that wars aren't won by the best weapon. They're won by the best system. Germany had the ME-262 first. But they couldn't fuel it, couldn't maintain it, couldn't mass-produce it. The jet age arrived in Germany as a desperate, beautiful anomaly. In America, it arrived as infrastructure. After the war, German aerospace engineer Willy Messerschmitt was interviewed by U.S. intelligence officers. When asked about the P-80, he said, We designed a fighter for aces. You designed a fighter for factories. That is why you won. The P-80 went on to become America's first operational jet fighter, serving through the Korean War but its greatest victory happened before it ever fired a shot. When it appeared in the skies over Europe and whispered to a dying regime, you're already obsolete. On that foggy March morning in 1945, when Lieutenant Colonel William Council lifted off from RAF Manston, he wasn't just flying a jet. He was flying a message. And the world heard it loud and clear. 